Let's turn to the Word of God together, shall we, and open our Bibles to Hebrews, the seventh chapter. Hebrews chapter 7, transitioning from chapter 6 to 7 as we work our way through this mighty book and the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. If you'd follow along, please, as I begin reading chapter 7 of Hebrews, now verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Will you pray with me this morning? Father God, we turn our attention to your word. and By doing that, Lord, we pray to turn our attention to you. We pray to know you, our God. We pray to know Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Lord, we acknowledge that we have not been diligent to know Jesus as high priest as we ought. And we pray that this study will rectify that, will bring us into a mature and higher understanding of the work of Jesus Christ in his person as high priest in that office and of his ministry as high priest in that office. Help us in this, Lord, that we might become people of deeper faith, that we might, through this knowledge, draw near to you boldly, knowing that Jesus, our great high priest, is delivering us into your presence behind the veil. We ask your help for the preacher here in the pulpit, we ask for your help for your people in the pew. And whoever listens to these words, may you edify them and help us all in this endeavor. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Maturity has been called upon to grow and to know, and to know our great high priest, a hope, an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, that enters behind the veil, a forerunner for us all in Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Today, every Christian needs a high priest. Let me say that again. Every believer who comes to faith in Jesus Christ needs the ministry of Jesus, the great high priest. He is indeed a necessary element in our approach to God in our ability to draw near with a clear and sure conscience. We have been introduced to the Melchizedekian priesthood of Christ Jesus a number of times as the writer of Hebrews has brought him in and now is bringing us to the point where he will flesh out just what is this office of high priest that Jesus holds and what is his ministry all about and why it matters to us? We recall to our minds chapter 5 and we read in verse 5, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, It was God who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he, God, also said in another place, you, Jesus, are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
Again, skipping down in Hebrews 5 to chapter or verse 10, it says, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, repeated. This comes to us and takes us all the way back to the Genesis account. As we have read here, even Abraham in verse 1, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So we've now gone from this point in history where there are Hebrew Christians of the new covenant and we go back in history and time to the point where there was no Mosaic covenant as of yet. There was an Abrahamic covenant to Abraham, the father of Israel, to whom a tithe was paid. After Abraham had fought against the kings in the valleys of Sodom and Gomorrah and defeated them and had released his nephew Lot from captivity and then honored God through this priest, this is he whom we begin to study. That's all I'm going to say about that event now because in verses five and follow, or verses four and following of chapter seven, I'm going to hit it hard. This morning, I want us to start wrapping ourselves around the necessity of understanding why Melchizedek is mentioned and why Jesus is seen as a high priest in the order of this person, Melchizedek. Now, let me add by way of caveat or understanding, and, and you might already know this, and some of you I'm sure do, and perhaps some of you even struggle with where commentators struggle with these verses that we are studying. Because as soon as we find Melchizedek and an Old Testament ref reference to him, the question is, who was Melchizedek? Then the question becomes, what was Melchizedek? And then the question becomes, if you're a teacher or a scholar, what is my position on who and what Melchizedek was and is. I have a position that I shall teach. But I also say there are other views. Some see him as an angelic being, an angel made manifest, ministering in this way. Some say that this is a Christophany. A Christophany is a, an Old Testament appearance of, of Christ the Son before his incarnation in the flesh. And there are some of those, and some say this is one. There are many and others. Some say this is even Shem of the Old Testament, and the list goes on. I need not burden you with it. I take special note of one word that helps me very much in determining my position and that is the word like, like. We hear in our text, in the end of verse 3, but made like the Son of God. And say so he was the Son of God, but made like the Son of God. So from that, my position is, I see Melchizedek of the Old Testament as a real historical figure who is a type of Christ who will come. A type of the Christ who will come. Don't get too worried about that yet. I'll worry you in just a few moments. But for this morning, this high priestly order of Melchizedek must be seen as being superior. The Hebrew writer is now going to appeal to the Hebrews who have held those in the Levitical, Aaronic priesthood in high regard, and he's going to call on them to put them in their place as lower on the scale of priority, ascendancy, work, and longevity when compared to the order of Melchizedek. And this Hebrews 7, 1 through 3 this morning, we are going to see five descriptions. It will provide us with five descriptions of the priestly order of Melchizedek. And these five descriptions that mark his ministry as superior to those of Aaron. 
This is all done so that we might understand his role and thereby draw near unto Christ and the God that he leads us to. Shall we begin? Let's do it. We begin that Jesus Christ is and of the order of Melchizedek. He is of the order of Melchizedek, firmly stated. For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, this whom we've had repeated many times, you are of the order of Melchizedek. So our first description of the five of the superior order of Melchizedek is this letter A in your notes. Melchizedek was an Old Testament type of Christ, a type of of Christ. Now, what does that mean? How do we understand in interpretive fashion what a type is and when we have found one or not? This perhaps could be one of the most misused areas of biblical interpretation uh, in all of Bible interpretation. It is easy to sometimes go back and think you have found something that prefigures Christ in the Old Testament when that case is not exactly true. I have heard some preachers and teachers make a lot even about some of the elements or the pieces and parts of the tabernacle that God had commanded Israel to make, for instance, some would say the acacia wood poles that go through the curtains to hold them together. Well, that's a type of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit holds it together. May I just quote a theologian of old who used to sell tuna? Sorry, Charlie. That's not the way we do it. So I'm going to explain to you the difference between a type and an antitype. Right there by saying that, I realize I enter into the realm of some confusion. The type comes before the antitype. The type pictures the antitype. So let's put it this way. The priest in the Old Testament, Genesis, Melchizedek, was the type of high priest. Jesus, the high priest, is the antitype. Now let me explain the differences and how we see these things. So on this side, the type, Melchizedek, the real person of the Old Testament, is a prediction or a foreshadowing of the coming at antitype. So the type predicts or foreshadows the coming antitype. This is in your notes. Fill in the blanks. Don't lose it. This is good stuff. It will help you in determining when someone is trying to teach you from a type and it's not one, and whether it is a type or not, in your own study. Uh, Lowercase letter b now. So Melchizedek, the type, is a picture of or a prefigurement of the antitype. Third, C, types are real historical people or things. Let me say that again. Types are real historical people or things that point to the future antitype, but key to understand, they are imperfect and temporary. They're imperfect and temporary. Though there was a high priest Melchizedek in the Old Testament, that does not make him a deity like Christ was. It does not make him perfect in everything that he did, but he is, in a sense, showing you something about that coming one. Okay? D. Lowercase d, the types resemble the antitype. So Melchizedek resembles in his high priestly ministry the ministry of Jesus Christ that was to come 
as a high priest. And they do it in some, listen now, specific way. They do it in some specific way or ways, but they do not reveal the complete nature of the antitypes. Let me say it this way. Though Melchizedek was real and lived in this way and has these characteristics, that does not encapsulate the entirety of the superior ministry of Jesus the Christ, who is also a high priest. It gives us some information on him, Jesus, but not all the information on Jesus the Christ. So they are limited in their scope. E. Types are inferior to the superior antitype. So to be a type, you must be less than the antitype. So Melchizedek, the high priest that Abraham gave a tithe to in Genesis 14, is inferior to Jesus, the high priest. He is less than. Uh, for instance, Christ's redemptive work is greater than the type that is presented to us in the Passover observance. When God was calling his people out of Egypt, he did that by a deliverer. And there was a deliverer in the form of a lamb. The lamb was to be slain. The blood of the lamb was to be put above the door and the post above the lintel and on the sides of the door so that the angel of death would pass by that house and deliver them from God's wrath in taking the firstborn children. Christ is the superior antitype to that. Christ is not a lamb in toto, though John the Baptist would say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It was prefigured by the type, the lamb of the Passover. Now, letter F. Types are not analogies. So Melchizedek is not an analogy of Christ in his priestly role. Or an illustration. So it's not a, it is not an analogy or an illustration. They are resemblances. They are resemblances. Now, key word, planned. Write that in your notes. Planned by God. The reason there is a type in history is because God put the type there to be recognized as part of his revelatory process telling mankind what was to come and what was planned by God. So one will resemble the coming one to fulfill God's planned outcome. So Melchizedek was a real person hundreds of years before to point to what he plans. Letter E. To show, types are to show divine design. So Melchizedek is to show us the divine design, or if you will, the plan of our previous point, between, listen now, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So Melchizedek links us all the way back to Genesis and Father Abraham and brings us all the way into the New Testament church of the new covenant under Christ Jesus. It's a link by divine design. He is a type. I'm going to show you the ways in which he is a type of Christ. And then from that, we will gain some information as to, as to this type, this coming one, this Jesus of who he was. So here we are in our first description. Melchizedek's priesthood was universal, not national. 
So in going back and highlighting the ministry in the Old Testament of Melchizedek, we find that the ministry of Jesus, the great high priest, was universal, not national. What does that mean? It means it's not just to Israel, but to the entire world. The ministry and priesthood of Melchizedek and thereby Jesus was of that kind. And we learn that from our text here. It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, listen now, this is what I'm focusing on, priest of the most high God. Priest of the most high God. The key is the most high God. Now, why do I point this out? Why is it significant? And why does that tie into national and universal? It's because of the name used. There's a significant name for the God of Israel that, God, that they used and that God used for himself with his covenant people. That name was Yahweh, sometimes also pronounced Jehovah. Yahweh God and his name was uniquely related to God's people and their covenant together with God. It's a covenant name. It was such a high name for the people of Israel that they would not pronounce it even when they read the scripture. They would never read Yahweh as they would read through the Hebrew text. When they came to that name, it was considered so high and so holy that they would not allow their lips to form his name and they would put in there, in its place, the name Adonai. Even today, Orthodox Jews will not say Yahweh God. They will say Adonai. So we have a different name here than Yahweh. Yahweh was not used in this text for us in the New Testament Greek, but rather in the Greek, something of highness. We even say that today. If you're talking to a king, it's appropriate to say, your highness. You're in a higher position. And in this case, because he is the only one and true God, we find the most high God in the Greek, but we also find that it has a parallel in the Old Testament Hebrew. The Old Testament Hebrew, when they were dictating uh, these truths about God most high, they would use the term El Elion, El Elion, God Most High, or we might even find it translating, translated Almighty God. And that is a more universal name. So Yahweh was a national name and for God, and El Elion was more of a universal name for all people under his rule and majesty. The entire world is under God Almighty. He is God Almighty to everyone. He is the possessor of the heavens and the earth. So this is a God that the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand is above all nations, not just the nation of Israel, but above all national or dispensational distinction over Jews and Gentiles alike. Now, this is a term that we do find when Melchizedek is brought forward to us. And I want to read just a few slices of Genesis 14 here, beginning in verse 18. So Abram is coming up after the defeat of the valley, of the kings in the valley. And then, verse 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Listen now, he was the priest of God Most High. He was the priest of El Elyon. That's who he was. El Elyon. We find it again in verse 22. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. So the Most High God that possesses on a universal scale everything that's in heaven and and on earth. That is the Old Testament understanding. 
This is brought forward even in our Greek understanding in the New Testament. And I highlight for you that in the highest realms of power, where God not only works on earth, but in the spiritual realm, there is a name oft used for God that is parallel to El Elyon, and it is what we have in Hebrews of Melchizedek as priest of Most High God, and we find it first in Mark 5, verse 7. Jesus is traveling, he's gone across the sea, and he has just run into the demoniac of the Gadarenes a very famous possessed man, and he was possessed by so many demons that when Jesus asked him, what is your name? The demons answered, legion, for we are many. And these are the ones who asked to be cast out, not just anywhere, but into a herd of swine, which Jesus did because he is, of course, God most high. And the swine ran and killed themselves in the sea. But what is interesting for us is how they addressed Jesus Christ. Listen to Mark 5, 7. And he cried out, this is the demon-possessed man, and he cried out with a loud voice, through the voice of the demon, he cried out with a loud voice and said, quote, What have I to do with you, Jesus, listen, son of the most high God. There you have it. So this is universal. Even the demon knows in the realm, he's not talking to Israel, he's talking to the whole realm under which God rules, including the realm of angels and demons. I implore you by God that you do not torment me, or as a parallel passage has, torment me before the time, knowing that most high God indeed will judge all the fallen angels and by the way, don't you know that you will judge angels? If you know what book that's from, there's extra points later. Now, down to another reference, Acts 16, 16. In Acts 16, 16, and 17, Paul, Barnabas, meet a slave girl. A slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination, and she will identify the God of Paul in this exact same way. Now pay attention. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. So if you wonder what's behind some of these fortune tellers, well, there you have it. That's why God says, pay no attention to them, have nothing to do with them, because demons are involved. Demons do know some things. They've lived longer than us. But they don't know everything, as we will find out. This girl, verse 17, followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, quote, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, she was doing that not to glorify God in, in essence, but she wanted to piggyback on their power so that she would get more standy. But didn't quite work. Because Paul said, you know what, I'm done with this. She's a nuisance. Cast out the demon. And then the guys that had this slave girl who could now no longer tell fortunes were highly upset. You see, money is the root of all evil. All right. Now, again, in Luke, I want you to turn there, chapter 1, verse 31. We have an angelic testimony to Mary, the mother of Jesus. So we've gone from the realm of the demons, but in the same realm now, the good angels, the angel that was sent to Mary to announce that she would be the mother of the Mashiach, of the Messiah, the Christ. And he says, and behold, verse 31, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called, here it is, the Son of the Highest. The Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. A lot of theology wrapped up there, and I deftly sidestep your questions and move on to the second description. 
of the superior order of Melchizedek. Number, number two in your notes, Melchizedek's priesthood is royal, is a royal priesthood. So we're still in typology. Melchizedek of the Old Testament is being remembered to us in his positions and roles. And then we see that Christ will be the fulfillment of those roles that Melchizedek in the Old Testament functioned in. So now we look at Melchizedek in the Old Testament was royal, knowing that Jesus as well is royal of a higher degree. Listen to the descriptions again, Hebrews 7. Mel, this Melchizedek, king of Salem. That is the first time king is used in this text, but it's used in these two verses Four times, no less than four times, is the Old Testament priest of God Most High recognized as being a king. We find him as king of Salem. And then when we move down, we see in verse 2, whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated, listen, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, king, king, king. So in my interpretive thing, I said, you know what? There's a king. And so now it's in your notes. We know he's a king. He has repeated that. He's a king and he was a high priest and he prefigures the high priestly and kingly role of Jesus the Christ. Why is that important? It is important especially to teach this to a Hebrew and to Hebrews who have lived under the Mosaic Covenant their whole life and for hundreds of years. And under the Mosaic Covenant, the high priest as an office and the king as an office were separate. Separate offices with separate roles and the two could not do the other's role. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you by way of example how bad it is when a king tries to take the role of priest. And so I turn your attention back to the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles, chapter 26, beginning in verse 16. We find a king, Uzziah, who, by the way, is listed in the good kings of Israel, the kings who followed uh, the way of the Lord. He is the son of Amaziah, and he did, even according to this passage, did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But having done that, he was a great success. And sometimes even when those who believe in God and follow him, when God makes them a great success, they sometimes get puffed up with pride. It doesn't mean they lose their salvation. It does mean they're in line for a good punishment from their faithful Lord and Savior. Can I have a testimony? I thought we all might relate. In verse 16, then, of 2 Chronicles 26, we see Uzziah usurping the role of high priest. Listen. But when he, Uzziah, was strong was strong. When he was strong, when he had succeeded, his heart was lifted up, meaning with pride, to his destruction. Pride cometh before what? The fall. And his pride is definitely preceding his fall. For he transgressed against the Lord his God, now note, by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. He went into the holy place where only the priests are to burn incense to the Lord. And so here's what happened, verse 17. So Azariah, the priest, went in after him. Now I tell you, this is a guy who I admire. The king's doing wrong, and he goes after him to help out and point out his wrongness. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him, listen, he didn't go alone. This is also probably a good idea. Were 80 priests. 80 priests of the Lord is like, okay, guys, he's in there. He's doing this. What are we going to do? 
Well, we'll come with you. And that, for that reason, they are called in this, in this book, valiant men. There's nothing worse than confronting a king about his error when the king has the right of life and death over you. It's been done before. The priests have been killed. And they go in. They were indeed valiant men. And that just tells you that, you know, those who serve the Lord can be valiant in confronting error. And I think we live in an age where more of us need to be valiant in confronting kings and leaders with error. May I just, this is a commercial, this is free. It, it parallels. If you haven't read it yet, please go online, go to gracechurch.org, or uh, I think it's called, or uh, Grace Community Church's website, and download John MacArthur's letter, his open letter to Governor Gavin Newsom. I think he's being valiant and biblical. Take the opportunity to do that. That is the role. And if you wonder if that is our appropriate role, then listen to his sermon that's on Grace to You, I think from the last Sunday in September, but it might have been first in October. You check. You'll know it when you see the title. And then listen to the biblical exposition of why that's important for spiritual leaders to speak to political leaders when political leaders are in sin against God. That's all I'm going to say. End of commercial. Back to regularly scheduled programming. It's wrong for this to happen. And so Azariah, the priests went after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men, and they withstood King Uzziah, they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of here. Oh, no, it says, Get out of the sanctuary. They said, Get out of here. You don't belong here. You have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. He had become so puffed up that he thought he was in such good standing with God that he could go and lead worship himself. He could go and take this role from the priest and offer himself and have nothing come of it. And you know how he responded? He was kind and gentle and said, Oh, thank you for warning me, and I'm going to get out of here. Please forgive my trespass. Some of you are laughing because you've read this text. No, he did not. He took the censer that he had in his hand, and he was about to put the wumpens on these guys who told him not to, and God struck him with leprosy. And in horror, the priests recoiled. And then he saw himself to have become leprous. And he ran out of the temple. And King Uzziah, who even followed the Lord in his youth, died a leper for usurping the role of priest as a king. That's why it's important to Jews. That's why it's important to the Hebrews. What is being said is that Jesus Christ in his high priestly role will have a role of a high priest, but like Melchizedek, he will also be a king. He will be royalty. Easier for us New Testament, New Covenant people to understand, harder for the Hebrews, hence the teaching. For even their own prophet, Zechariah, had prophesied of a coming superior high priest that would combine the office of king and the order or the office of high priest together. And God did that in the book of Zechariah by using the high priest that had returned from captivity and the king who had returned from captivity. And he did a crowning ceremony in this wise of the high priest. In Zechariah 6 verse 11 we see the prediction of this dual role for the Messiah. When Zechariah says, Take the silver and the gold, make an elaborate crown, and set it on the head 
of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, listen, the high priest. So they've just crowned a high priest in prophetic hope of a day when a priest king would come. Then verse 12. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. And here's an important feature. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on the throne, on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. They will be married together, both offices, in the person of Jesus Christ, king and high priest. This is what all of Israel was hoping for. This is why the, why the Melchizedekian priesthood matters. In the Messianic Psalm 110, we also read verse 1 and following. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Of course, that is David who is writing this, the king, and the one who would be the coming king. Verse 2, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the days of your power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn, now listen, here we go, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That is what the writer of Hebrews keeps repeating, 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 king and priest. So the king of Salem, this ancient name for a place, and there's a lot of debate here. I tend to fall on the Jerusalem side, so that I will teach. King of Salem, Salem was an ancient name for Jerusalem. It basically means peace. That's where we get shalom. That's why Jerusalem, the city of peace. So we have in our text, king of peace. Then king of Salem, also meaning king of peace. And he shall be called the prince of peace. The third description of the superior order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek's priesthood was righteous and peaceful. Righteous and peaceful. Notice the second half of verse 2 in chapter 7. Being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So Melchizedek's rule was marked by both righteousness and peace. And it's very likely that before David came to make Jerusalem his capital, this person, Melchizedek, this high priest of God Most High, was there serving as a high priest to God and also serving as a king over this city-state. We know nothing more than what is in our text about this man. But he had those offices and he had to have functioned in them or he wouldn't have prefigured by way of type Jesus the Christ. And so we move on to say, well, what was this purpose of the high priest? The purpose of the Aaronic high priest, those that come from Aaron, the Levites, it was that they were to obtain righteousness for the people. The people were not righteous, they were sinful. They had to be brought to God to be made righteous by faith. That's why you come to God. Your coming to God doesn't make you righteous. God makes you righteous and you come to God by faith. And then you do righteousness because you've been changed by faith through grace, Old Testament and New. So priests were to lead people to find righteousness from God. And the sacrificial system that they used 
was used to prefigure and restore the right relationship with God because they're sinners. All men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's a New Testament truth and an Old Testament truth. An Old Testament believer during the time of the Mosaic Covenant, when there was an Aaronic high priest of the Levites serving in the temple, would then by faith bring in his sacrificial offering for his sin. Why? Because he has faith in God who relieves sin, that if he obeys God and if he follows God, it's an act of faith, and God will then render him a standing before God of righteous, meaning not needing judgment. You're righteous, you do not need to be judged. If you're unrighteous, you get the judgment from God. But this kind of sacrifice that was done by the high priest was made temporary. It did not cover long term. So even when it was offered properly, it was temporary. Even the sacrifices themselves were a type of Christ's permanent sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. The main point is that Christ's priesthood is better and brought righteousness and then peace. King of righteousness, king of peace. It is very important, and I even put an article in your bulletin today to read about the priority of righteousness before peace. There will be no peace on earth lest the Lord bring righteousness. Ask the people who live in Chicago. Ask the people who live in Portland. Ask us who live even as I heard this week in Billings of the crime rate escalating in little Montana in our big city Billings. There is no peace until the king of peace brings righteousness. He judges the unrighteous with true judgment and punishment, and he will bring people to righteousness through his own sacrifice. In Romans, this is brought to the fore of the preceding righteousness and then peace. In chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, it says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. If you haven't been justified by faith, like Abraham believed God, it was counted for righteousness, you will not have peace with God. So this priesthood is better. It brings righteousness and peace. Let me end with this group of verses from Psalm 85. It speaks also of the coming Messiah and gives good instruction as well as a theological understanding of this righteousness and peace. I begin in 85 verse 9. Surely his salvation is near. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. What a beautiful turn of a phrase. And then notice its second feature. Mercy and truth have met together. It's like a meeting. It's almost a love relationship. Mercy and truth have met together. Listen to these words. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Did I just say that in church? I did. Because it's in your Bible. It is to show us the closeness of relationship of the nearness and the dearness, and even of the one to the other, mercy and truth have met together. Lest God have mercy on us, the truth will kill us. Righteousness and peace have kissed. God giving us righteousness then brings peace, and there is no peace, there is no fellowship, there is no relationship of the kiss of peace. And by the way, that's how they used to greet one another. And even Paul will say, by way of instruction to the church, are you familiar with this? Greet one another with a holy what? Oh, he must be. It must be a typo. It must be an addition. No, that there is to be a peaceful relationship. Let holy men of God raise up their hands without wrath or doubting. In peace. To hold up your hands is to say, peace. I have no weapons. I'm at peace. Here. 
I'll give you the kiss of friendship. I'll give you the kiss of peace. Righteousness and peace have kissed. And they will only kiss through the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ, the great high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, let us hold fast our confession. We confess this to be true. He is that great high priest. And the rest we shall finish in another date. But I pray God comes and delivers us into full righteousness and raptures us out of here and I can't finish the last two points. But in case not, I'll keep the notes. Let's pray. Father God, as we prepare our hearts for the observance of the Lord's table, our Lord's table, wherein his sacrifices that he presented to you as great high priest are remembered. I pray today for someone who is out here who has not yet placed their trust, their whole heart in Jesus Christ the Savior, trusting and believing that he took their place on the cross and paid their price that they owe to God for their sins. I pray that they would do that now. Trust Jesus that he stood in your place and took the wrath of God for your sin that you deserve. And then commit yourself to following him and becoming a disciple of Christ. I pray that you would know that and then would join us in remembering this sacrifice of Jesus. And I pray for all of us who know Jesus Christ already that this truth that we have learned today would expand and broaden our faith. That our faith would surround it, accept it, and live on it so that we might more firmly trust in Jesus to bring us into the presence of God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen.